Good morning. I want to welcome you here to North Beaver Baptist Church, and we're glad to have you. And we're going to get started right now, and uh, I'm just going to welcome you here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for braving all the the weather out here. It's been a little rainy, but we thank you. You know, and it's kind of strange. In the Old Testament, rain was a sign from God that He was happy with the people. And it was drought, the lack of rain. Uh, so we thank the Lord. But we're here today, We're the. Uh, I, I want to greet the sons and daughters of God. We're here today to worship God, to serve Him, to sing His praises, to preach His Word, to uh, bring the tithes and offerings, and mainly lift Him up and glorify Him, because that's what worship is. So we're glad to see you here today. We're going to turn it over right now uh, to Brother Carlton. And uh, he's going to do the power. Are you going to sing first? Let's sing first. Okay. And then Brother Carlton. That'll give Carlton time to get all his notes together. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's sing praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Amen. It's good to see you. I'm glad you're here today. I get all my notes straight now, too. Y'all go ahead and stand, and we'll sing a song. Curtis, you'll need to turn it up. We will sing a song together. We're going to sing... Hill called Mount Calvary.
Good morning. It is great to see everyone here. Before I read the power verse, I got a couple of announcements. Uh, do remember this is Pastor Appreciation Month. Amen. So the last Sunday, I think it's the 25th, we will take a love offering up for our pastor and his family. So do remember that on the 25th. And also, we had talked about having a fall festival. Don't know that that's going to happen. Uh, just due to all the different things going on now, we're probably just not going to have that this year. So just to let you know that. So. We'll have two next year. Okay. Okay. All right. What about three? This has been on my heart probably about all year this year. And it just seemed like a good time to talk about it. Um, how hard is forgiveness? It's hard, isn't it? What does it cost you? What does forgiveness cost you? I wrote down, I, I, I went and did, you know, searching and through the Bible, and I wrote down all these verses talking about forgiveness. But the best one, and everybody's very familiar with it, that I could come up with was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Where does forgiveness start? It starts in the heart, doesn't it? Where does unforgiveness live? It lives in the heart also. I heard a, a, a person was talking to me this week about kudzu. Everybody knows what kudzu is. They say it can grow up to a foot a day. You think unforgiveness can grow a foot a day? It grows in our heart, doesn't it? We have to keep it trimmed down, and then it starts growing again. The big thing is we have to remove it. Not easy. What did it cost God when He forgave us? It cost Him His Son, didn't it? Forgiveness is hard. I think if we all want to be honest, we all struggle with it. I struggle with it. Things happen. I go, that ain't right. How can I love this person after the things they've done or this or that? It's very hard. And that starts growing in the heart. Prayer. Prayer is the key to unforgiveness. It's easy to forgive if we let God help us. But if we don't, it'll continue to grow. We'll trim it back. And then it'll start growing again. We need to remove it from the heart. Easier said than done. It's it very, very hard, but it, it is something that we all, especially me, needs to work on. I have areas in my life that I can't, I just can't forgive these people. I try to, but it's hard. We have to work on it. Let's have a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just do thank you for this day. Lord, we just hope that your words will be heard today. Lord, we hope that you are in control of our lives today. Lord, help us when we have these times when it seems like we can't forgive people. Lord, we know that you forgave us. Lord, help us to reflect you in our lives. Lord, always help us to um, seek you, seek your goodness, your guidance, and all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, I, I, yeah, and we, you know, here again, kind of been a crazy year. Your one every month, please put your one down and pray for them. We started at the first of the year, and then we have got derailed because of coming together, getting together. So if you've got somebody, write their name down. 
put in our basket of prayers. Pray for them for a month. We'll see great changes in our lives and their lives Amen. by doing that. So we'll turn it over back to April. Thank you for that, Paul. Thank you. What I didn't know I needed to hear today, but I did. All right, let's stand again and sing. You know what? I'm glad today that the relative goodness or badness of our circumstances and whatever we're going through doesn't change the absolute greatness of our God. Amen. And no matter what we've got going on and what we're dealing with and what may come up and how life might treat us, we can stand here today and say... How great is our God. Amen. So let's just join our hearts together today and worship him with this song. How great is our God.
Amen. How about that? Amen. I tell you, if worship's about saying something about God that He deserves, that's it right there. Amen. Our God is great. Great, great. You know what great is? I told you that one time. And I told you that would be on the test. Um, when the, Bible, the Bible uses the word great different than we do. You'll notice when God says something great, it's not like... We'll, we'll say, man, that guy down there on the street, down the corner at the restaurant's got a great hot dog. Well, that may be. I know Mason does back there at the backyard set. But uh, God uses the word great because it, it is saying that whatever He's describing is great. There's nothing else to that level. When something is great, there's nothing above it. There's nothing better. Uh, so uh, God doesn't throw that word around kind of loosely, but He uses it to, to describe Himself. He uses it to describe His Son. He uses it to describe salvation. Uh, things that there's really nothing, anything better. And that's the way He uses the word great. Now that's not the sermon today. Don't get ready to leave. <laughs> that was free, by the way. It cost you a thing. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. I remind you to continue to pray for all those in our church who are struggling and going through things. And uh, I remind you also to pray for our nation. We are rapidly coming up into a time that we're going to be voting, and that's all, that's that's very important, folks. Uh, I'm I'm not here morning, this morning to tell you who to vote for. But I'm just saying you need to uh, check out what the candidates believe. That's that's local, and national, everything, and vote uh, according to what you believe is right. And uh, we, our nation, uh, you know, it, it's a pretty listen. Every election is important, uh, but uh, this, uh, you know, they always say, well, this is one that's going to. I think there's going to be a lot of ramifications from this one. But I know God's in control. That's what I'm going to preach about today. Daniel chapter 7. But to do, do pray and pray for our nation, our leaders. Pray for all our leaders. Uh, don't pray for just the ones that uh, you like. Uh, I, I pray, I've prayed for presidents. Uh, prayed for people that, that I really didn't agree with. Because you know why? The Bible commands us to. He said pray for those who are in authority, that we might live a quiet and peaceable life. And I've always believed that maybe sometimes when we're in situations like this, in our nation, it's maybe because we haven't prayed like we should. And I'm sure that's partly the case. Turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. It is good to see you here today. We are having services here, uh, live and in person. And uh, I believe we're doing it uh, safely, and that was our goal. We want to have church, but we, we definitely want to uh, be safe, and uh, I appreciate you being here and being a part of that. But I want to speak to you this morning. We're going back to the, the book of Daniel. Uh, we were there a little bit before, and I took a break. We went up through Daniel chapter 6, which that is a normal break in the book of Daniel. The first six chapters mainly focus on Daniel and his interaction with the different kings. And what we, the question we asked in Daniel chapter 1 through chapter 6 was, are you influencing your society that you live in, or is the society influencing you? Now we could use, a, maybe even a better term would be, are you changing the society you live in, or is the society you live in changing you? And that's been, a, that's been a struggle down through the ages. When God's people, whether it's during the church age now, or in the Old Testament or whatever, are thrust into a society and a culture that is counter to them. We've got a counterculture movement, they say, out in the, in the world today that's... Uh, uh, trying to turn everything around, you know, uh, uh, make cats out of dogs and whatever. I don't know. Uh, they're just trying to change everything around. I know if you're my age, 
uh, you probably don't recognize a lot of the things that are going on in our nation today. And, uh, and part of that is because there is an effort, uh, and always has been, uh, to change the culture. And that Daniel was thrust into a situation where they tried to change him. First thing they said is, you're not, your, your name is not Daniel anymore. It's Belteshazzar. That means the one who shines for Baal. So Daniel went from a name that glorified the God of Israel, and they went down there when they took him back to Babylon. You know, he was captive. He didn't go willingly. He was a captive, as many others were. And then they said, well, we're going to change your diet. That's what we see in Daniel chapter 1. We want you to eat like we eat. And they, then they said, we want you to talk like we talk and act like we act. And of course, obviously, the, they're heading toward this. We want you to worship the gods we worship. And that's, that's, been, that's been the plan of the evil one from the beginning. God, uh, you know, God created it, put Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, Satan came along and said, well, you know, I've got a different way to live. And Satan influenced Adam and Eve to the point that they made a choice to follow, follow his leadership and not God's. So here we are in 2020, and it's still going on. But in Daniel chapter 7, we begin to look at Daniel still on the scene, and actually, he, 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 he's, he's recorded here in Daniel chapter 7 a vision that he had during the time of Daniel chapter 4 and 5 when Belshazzar, who was a Babylonian king, uh, took over. He was the one who threw the party, remember. And uh, right in the middle of the party where they were blaspheming God and and using the instruments of, of out of the temple in Jerusalem, and there was a 200,000-man Medo-Persian army outside, and he didn't care. And all of a sudden, he say, seen a hand writing on the wall. No arm, no body, just a hand. And the Bible says his knees smoked together. I've been there. I went over to Roger's house uh, several months ago and he's got a beautiful wonderful dog but it it's a giant dog it it may be a hairy elephant i don't know if it's even a dog and uh for some reason he just didn't want to let me on the porch that night and uh, my knees smoked together <laughs> as i was leaving but anyway in daniel chapter 7 and I believe Daniel chapter 7 through chapter 12 is probably as difficult a section of Scripture or a part of a, a biblical uh, of the Bible uh, as far as teaching it and preaching it. Not because there's anything wrong with it. Not because God was trying to be uh, deceptive. It's just simply the, what it talks about and uh, the picture it paints about the nations that are going to rise and fall. Rise and fall. That's what nations do. You know, if you had a map uh, that predated, or a globe that predated 1985, I read this the other day, if you wanted to be current, you would have to update 102 different nations and barriers um, of those nations from 1985 till now. A lot of times we don't think about that. You know, there, there's countries that existed before that don't exist now. There, there are uh, lines or, or boundaries of those countries that have changed drastically over just about 40 years. Uh, so, you know, that's the way it is in the world. And you say, well, what's it all about? Go ahead and say that. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. God's plan for the nations is unfolding every minute of every day. 
Now we get up and go to our work, nothing wrong with that. We get up and go to school, nothing wrong with that. Or we get up and lay around like I do now. And I don't guess there's anything wrong with that. But this plan and this history, if you will, is day by day unfolding. I asked the question this morning, God rules the nations, does He rule our lives? Same principle. In other words, you look at the world and say, oh, God's ruling the world. But then we personalize it and say, but is He ruling in my heart and life? <laughs> Boy, now wait a minute, preacher. You know, that other sounded pretty good. This sounds like you're beginning to meddle now. You know, when you start talking about what's going on between me and God. But I want to give you this morning, we're kind of kicking off Daniel 7 because in Daniel 7, and then uh, the consequential chapters on to chapter 12, we are going to see the key to end time prophecy. Prophecy is interesting. We should study prophecy. I know it seems like over the years, there's been almost two schools of thought only. All prophecy on one hand, uh, it's study all the prophecy and everything is prophetic. And uh, if a bird falls from a sky or a wheel runs off a truck on the interstate, try to find that prophetically in the Bible. And I'm being a little bit facetious, but in reality, it's been that way for some time. In other words, there's a group that says prophecy, they, they put so much emphasis on prophecy. Nothing wrong to put emphasis on it. But it's like it's the only thing. But then there's another group or, or a, a school of thinking that says, well, prophecy, yeah, you know, we've got so many other things we talk. We need to talk about the family. We need to talk about uh, evangelism. And we need to talk about, and all the other, and that's true. And then there's, it's almost like, well, we don't really need to study prophecy because it either happens, most people look at it this way, it either, the, pro the prophecy either happens a thousand years ago, or it's going to happen a thousand years ahead. So what, is it, what does it have any bearing on my life? But the truth of the matter, it does. Listen, first of all, don't we understand that if God didn't want us to study prophecy, not to the exclusion of everything else, but if God didn't want us to study prophecy and basically understand prophecy as best we can, why did He put it in the Bible? I mean, that seems kind of off base for a God that knows everything and does everything right. But the truth of the matter is, prophecy is very important. And I believe there's three basic reasons that prophecy is important. I'm just going to share these. It won't take me five minutes, so don't think it's the sermon. First of all, why should we study prophecy? Three basic reasons. Because pro revealed and fulfilled prophecy reminds us of the reliability of God and His Word. When we read and study about prophecy and then it come, uh, comes to pass, like many have, and there's still many that still yet to come to pass, but when they do come to pass, then we look up and say, hey, I remember God said that. God's Word said that. <coughs> so it reminds us, when prophecy is revealed and then fulfilled, it reminds us that God doesn't lie. That when He says something, it's going to happen. It may have not happened yet, or it may have happened in the past. Many of the things that, that, uh, that Daniel prophesied in Daniel happened during his life, and then some happened as far as 200 years later. He prophesies in Daniel 2 in the vision that, Nebuch that he interprets for Nebuchadnezzar that there will be a Roman Empire. Then he prophesies it again in a vision he receives in Daniel chapter 7. Then he mentions it again in several other places in chapter 8 and 9 and 11. And that happened 200 years after he died. That's prophecy, folks. When a man can say... This is going to happen. 
God's told me this is going to happen specifically about an area or a person or a situation or a circumstance or something God's going to do, then it happens, that's fulfilled prophecy. Daniel died in about, I think he died around, let me make sure because I wrote it down. I want to, uh, he, he might get me if I tell him when he died the wrong time. Daniel died in 337, about 337 B.C. Now remember, before, before the middle of the Bible, before Christ, it's, the numbers are big and then they go down to Christ. All history points to Christ, to the middle of the Bible, and then afterwards it's A.D., which it's Latin for Amino Dominino or Domino, uh, which means the year of our Lord. So Daniel, Daniel was captive taken captive right at, uh, right at about 535 B.C. and then five, about 337 he passed away. He was 70 years. Well, actually he spent the rest of his life in Babylon. You say, well, what's all this mean? It means that we can look at that and the things that Daniel prophesied uh, under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God and prophesied these things and then they came to pass and that proves, hey, that was of God. You know, like in the Old Testament, uh, the rule of a prophet was if he prophesied anything and like set a date, like he said, uh, you know, uh, somebody's going to do something, uh, Joe's going to do something ten days from now and it didn't happen, that prophet was in trouble. Because the rule was that prophet was to be stoned because he was a false prophet. So folks, we're reminded when revealed and uh, prophecy is revealed and fulfilled, we're reminded of how reliable God is and His Word is and He never fails and He never lies. That's a, that's a very valuable thing. You say, well, uh, is, is that the main reason? That's one of the reasons we should study prophecy. Second of all, we should study prophecy because it reminds us to look beyond today and realize that God rules now and then the past, present, and future. Revealed and fulfilled prophecy reminds us that God's in charge a hundred years ago, now, and a hundred years in the future. What it does, you know what prophecy does? If you read prophecy, the Bible says that uh, in the last days, after the last days, this earth is going to do what? Burn up. Have you ever, you ever thought about that? And you say, well, it's all going to burn up anyway. What are you doing? You're expressing a perspective that you have that is based on a prophetic, uh, a prophecy that God made. had not burned up yet, has it? But if you've got the perspective... If your perspective is based on the fact and you assume that God tells the truth and He never lies and He says that one day the elements shall melt with a fervent heat and everything we see will be burned up. Now there will be a new heaven and a new earth, but all this stuff will be burned up. That gives you a perspective to operate on. You're looking at things based on what God how God says they're going to work out, not necessarily on how you think they're going to work out or the world's going to work out. See, you ever thought about that? Our perspective comes from the fact that we believe in the prophecies that God has made. And then number three reason why we should study prophecy. Prophecy reminds us that the Lord's return is what I should be preparing for and looking for and not be caught aware, unaware of. Almost with every time Jesus talked about, especially His second coming. Now listen, there, there are hundreds of prophecies in the Word of God and a lot of them are not about the second coming. There's hundreds of prophecies in the Word of God that are not about uh, the rapture. There's hundreds of prophecies in the Bible that are not about other very important matters. There are, there are prophecies about individual people. There are prophecies about individual nations. There are prophecies about all kinds of things, and many of them 
Hundreds of them have already come to pass. Then there are those prophecies. The, the center of prophecy. Let's get this. The focus of prophecy is about one day and one event that's going to happen someday. And that's the second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the most prophesied event in the Word of God. It is the focus of the majority of, of future prophecy. Jesus talked about it all the time. He mentioned His kingdom and His kingdom follows His second coming. And all, all the Old Testament prophecy, the, there wasn't any Old Testament prophecy about the rapture because the church was a mystery. It wasn't revealed to the later on when Paul came along. So what are they talking about when Jesus comes? They're talking about the second coming. Jesus is coming back to this world. He's come before. Did you get that? A fellow asked me one time, do you, believe in, uh, do you believe people coming from outer space and other planets here? I said, absolutely. I said, I know one of them by name. Man, he's a Baptist preacher and he never, uh oh. <laughs> He'd been dipping in the communion wine or something. <laughs> no, I said, I, I, I know. I said, matter of fact, I know him very personally. His name is Jesus Christ. He came to this world. He didn't, he wasn't in this world. He came from heaven. I don't know how far heaven is out there, but I'll guarantee it classifies as outer space. And he came down, the Bible tells he came down, when he came down, what he did, uh, how long he lived, what happened to him, that he went back away. Listen, I got all that information about an alien. You see, he was alien. He belonged, he, his citizenship was in heaven. He came and visited us. But guess what? He's coming again. The Bible predicts that. Uh, but, the, major, the vast majority of prophecy and the vast majority of all the things God does, especially in the Old Testament, is about the second coming. Why? Because it is the greatest day in human history. I have, I've had people to kind of argue with me about that from time to time. They say, well, what about when he died on the cross? That was a great day. In, in the sense, not, not happy not joyous, although if we understand what He did for us on Calvary, we should be happy and joyous. But we tend to, we tend to rate days like that and things that are great a, diff, the different way that, a different way than God does. What about the rapture? Isn't that going to be a great day when the church is taken out? That could happen today. That can happen any moment. That could happen while you're dozing in the pew this morning. I've always wanted Jesus to come when we were at church. I can see some fella back there. How long does it take for the rapture to happen? A millisecond. You flash your eyes, and I mean, he's, he's sleeping, and all of a sudden he wakes up. He's in heaven. Man, this church looks different than it did when I went to sleep. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? I actually had a friend that was a uh, uh, member of uh, uh, some church down the States. I can't remember the name of it. But we went there. I shouldn't remember the name of it. Dr. Brother Walton even married us, so I can't remember the name of it now. But we had a pretty good side church. And they had renovated the basement of the church. So that Sunday morning when everybody got in there, the pastor said, well, hey, what are we going to do right now? He said, just put your Bibles down, your coats down, and everything. He said, we're going to all go down to the, the basement and look at the new fellowship hall and, and, uh, and have a word of prayer down there. So they all go down there. Well, this one fella who was habitually late to church comes in, he walks in the back door, cars all in the parking lot, lights are on, heat's running, coats, coats laying on the fuse. But nobody there. And he said, for, for an instant, for an instant, 
it flashed through his mind, I have missed the rapture. <laughs> Those are great days. And there's many others in the Word of God, but nothing is like the second coming. Because when Jesus comes at His second coming, He's going to defeat His enemies. He's going to restore His people Israel. He's going to establish His kingdom here on earth. And for a thousand years, as Zechariah said in Zechariah 14.9, there shall be one King and one God over the world. We've never had that, have we? We've had a whole bunch of kings. But there's going to be one King and one God. That's why that day is so great. So when we understand what prophecy is for and the benefit it uh, gives to us, like I say, it, that, that last point, it reminds us to be ready. If you're sitting here this morning, you're saved, born again child of God, you know beyond a shadow of doubt, been washed in the blood of Jesus, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, when you die you'll go to heaven. One day, you're going to be there at that second coming. You're ready. You're prepared. That's all you got to do. So let's look at Daniel 7, and I'm going to read just a few verses and kind of get started on it because you say we might start reading Daniel 7. And, and the reason I said all this about prophecy and other things is because when you start reading Daniel chapter 7, one of the first things your mind goes to, oh no, it's a bunch of history. Yeah, it is. I don't apologize for that. I don't apologize for what God put in the Bible. I preach it. And, you know, I put it on your plate. If you don't want to eat it, that's your problem. Okay? But let me tell you something. What do you think history is? His story. Isn't that neat? I don't know how that worked out, but I think it worked out good. All history. I've heard, I, I've even made this statement. All right, we're going to talk about Bible history. i got news for you. It's all Bible history. Everything that goes on in this world is a part of God's plan to bring about His kingdom where Jesus sits on the throne. That's what it's all about. So in Daniel chapter 7, now, Daniel's already had, Daniel has, Daniel's been interpreting visions, hasn't he? Daniel's been saying this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Nebuchadnezzar had a vision in chapter 2, and, and chapter 2 and chapter 7 go together. The only difference between Daniel 2, the vision in Daniel 2, it was Daniel interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the, of the nations unfolding. And then in Daniel chapter 7, it's Daniel interpreting his vision of the unfolding of the nations. But you'll notice, we won't go back there this morning, but I would encourage you to do that if you haven't, because I asked you to read read through Daniel anyway. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's vision is all about metals creating a statue of a man. Nebuchadnezzar was all about himself. He was all about mankind. Dan, the, the, the vision that he had, he interpreted it through his vision of how great men were. Now we get to Daniel chapter 7, you'll notice as we read, as God lays it out to Daniel and He's talking about these different empires, He don't describe them as gold and silver and precious stone and oh, how wonderful man is. No, He said they're like beasts. They're like vicious, ferocious, killing, marauding, tearing. As a matter of fact, He said to eat the flesh. That don't sound too noble, does it? You see, that's God's true perspective of mankind. We tend to blow ourselves up. If I wrote a book about me, believe me, it'd be a whole lot different than what I really am. You know? I remember my professor, one of my professors in school, he says one of the reasons he knew the Bible was true and written by God because God records, tells all about you warts and all. I mean, I, I'm not trying. Ain't not, I, I've had warts. I probably got some now. My, matter of fact, my mom used to call me warthead. Seemed like a couple of times. <laughs> but what he's saying was, God don't pull no strings when He writes the Bible. When He tells a story, you're going to get the truth. 
You see, in Daniel chapter 7, we begin to get the truth. Let's begin reading verse 1. And I believe I'm reading from the infallible and errant Word of God. I won't be able to share all that I wanted to share with you this morning because I wanted to preface this. I want you to understand that this is important. You saw it happened thousands of years ago. It's talking about things that are happening. Listen, we are in this section of Scripture. Our timetable. Doesn't mention it because it's a church age. But Daniel interprets a vision that God gives him that covers a period of 2,140 years. It covers a period of time that begins with him in Babylon and when Jesus comes back at the second coming. So you got it all. It's a whole picture. Don't you hate when you start watching a, a program on TV and you don't know that it's a two-part? Come on. I mean, the preacher gets up here and preaches five minutes over. Oh, God, I'm not going to survive. <laughs> and I'll agree, it's usually more than two minutes over. But then we get that, we, we're so engrossed with that show and that thing, and all of a sudden, to be continued. And they don't tell you when or where it's going to be continued. The, the logical thing would be to go right into it and no. Mm -mm. But we've got the whole story here from beginning to end, from Babylon till now, till beyond now, to when Jesus, the rock, comes and crushes. His enemies. Let's begin reading verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Now the first thing you recognize is that we're talking about Belshazzar, the, one of the last, the last Babylonian king who threw the party, and that was in Daniel 4 and 5. So he's, he's telling about a vision he had several years ago. Okay? And, uh, and uh, so he says, Belshazzar, king... Uh, the visions of his, Daniel, the visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. The four winds of heaven are the movements of God across the world constantly. The Bible says in the book of the Revelation, He will call to the angels of the four winds and they'll gather up everything. God controls it all. All our weather comes from wind. You understand that, don't you? And here these angels and these four winds are pictured as God stirs in the life of humanity. North, south, east, west. And then he says that uh, the four winds strove of the heaven upon the great sea. Now, that can be interpreted the Mediterranean Sea because these nations come out of it. It's right there at Israel on their coast. But the Great Sea is also spoken of in Psalms and Jeremiah and other places as the Sea of Humanity. Like a great sea. You know, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, John sees a great beast rise up out of the sea. I don't think he was talking about the actual Mediterranean. I think he was talking about the sea of humanity. There's going to be a time when that great beast, dragon empire, that last world, one world order, if you will, rises up under the control of the Antichrist. John sees that, calls it the great sea. Then he goes on and says, And four great beasts came up uh, from the sea, diverse one from another. They're described beasts, they are actual empires, and God describes them according to their character. The first is like a lion. That would be Babylon, because it corresponds with Daniel 2 and the head of gold. He says, I saw the first one, and it was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. Uh, if you go over to the British Museum in Sussex, England, they've got two giant statues that were moved from from uh, Iraq, uh, they were moved many, many years ago. They were actually moved out of where the ancient city of Babylon was. They're about 35 feet tall, and they are two lines with wings on their back. That was two of their gods. God says, 
Daniel says, I saw a lion that had eagle's wings. The lion speaks of the fierceness and the, and the power of the lion to consume its enemies. And the wings speak of the, probably of the swiftness they would move in battle. And I beheld till the wings of the earth were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He got blowed up with pride and what did God do? For seven years He made him eat grass like a cow. You remember we studied that? Well, that would humble you, wouldn't it? It says He made him stand like a man and a man's heart was given to him. I believe He's speaking about the time that God would humble Nebuchadnezzar. And these are things we're going to talk about over the next few months as I preach through this. I, I may not preach on it every Sunday, but I'm going to give you a picture. I'm going to preach through it so we'll understand. This is the key to prophecy. You get over in Revelation study, and if you don't understand what happened, what the picture of Daniel paints in Daniel 2 and in Daniel 7 and in other chapters in it, 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 it makes it a lot harder. But if you study this first and then you get over to oh yeah, that makes sense. Let's move on. He said the first was like a lion. And uh, then he said uh, uh, in verse 5, and behold another beast, so another empire rises up, and the second is like a bear. And it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour, and eat much flesh. I believe this is the Medo-Persian empire that took over Babylon. That's Belshazzar. is the one that was the king of Babylon at that time. When they threw that party and, and the hand wrote upon the wall and the 200,000 Medo-Persians uh, stopped up the Euphrates River that went under the uh, uh, under the Great Wall that was in, 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 impenetrable. Boy, that's a tough word. But they come over. They come under the wall when that river dried up and defeated Babylon that night. So he says here, this this next beast is like a bear, powerful, plodding, not as fast as. The lion, not as fast as the lion with eagles, but still powerful. And the Bible says, and, and, and this is historically what, you know, one of the things you may not understand, <clears throat> that till 18, let me tell this right, 18, I believe it's 1874, this was the history book in the schools. And still, people who unearth antiquities and things today, check it out with the Word of God because this has never been disproven. Because on he says it's a bear and it had three ribs in its mouth. The Medo-Persian Empire began when the Medo-Persian armies defeated three enemies. Uh, three empires, three smaller empires, and I've got their names here, but one of them was Egypt. One of them was Corsoran and, and another one. That's when, when they defeated those three, that became the Medo-Persian Empire. So here's this picture of a bear, and it's plodding, and it's powerful, and it's slow, but it says, Arise, devour much flesh. I believe what he's talking about there, I believe that is a prophetic statement about the fact that the Medo-Persian Empire in a lot of ways, wasn't as great as the Babylonians. Wasn't as great in a lot of ways as the Romans. A lot of, wasn't as great as the Greeks that are going to come after this with Alexander the Great. But they did this. They consumed more countries and put their mark and control over more land than any other empire that's ever existed. At one time, the Medo-Persian nation controlled 900,000 square miles. Folks, if you don't know what 900,000 square miles is, that's a lot of land territory. You see, it ate and ate and ate. Let's move on real quick. I'm just giving you an overview. 
We're going to come in. We're going to come over the next couple of weeks and we're going to fill in the blanks. And you're going to see how God is painting a picture of the nations rising and falling, rising and falling, rising and falling. And all what we learn in it is it. It's in His hand. He's in control. He says, There's another beast came up in verse 6, And I beheld unto another beast like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast had also four heads, and uh, dominion was given unto it. Bible scholars believe, and I believe through study, and I'm not no Bible scholar by any uh, statement of fact, But this is a representation of the next great empire that took over, and that was Greece. Everybody's probably studied about Alexander the Great in either junior high or high school. Became to power when he was 28 years old. And basically it became a world, it became a world empire. The the Greek army was noted for its swiftness to go to battle and its and it's wisdom to make decisions in battle. The swiftness is pictured in the four wings of a fowl, and the four heads uh, picture the wisdom, the military savvy. I mean, if you got one head, you got a lot of things. If you got four, you got four times that, don't you? So it's a picture of their wisdom when it came to defeating their enemies and dominion was given to it. And then finally, in verse 7, he said, And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. Now this beast is so different and so diverse and so, I don't know, terrible, that's what he uses it, that you can't compare it to an animal. You see, Daniel compared Babylon to a lion. He compared Medo-Persia to a bear, he compared Greece to a leopard. But when he seen this empire and seen how fierce it was and dreadful it was and terrible it was, he, he couldn't compare it to anything. There wasn't an animal that was that way. So he just said it's a beast. And it was strong exceedingly and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. This beast rose up, and it's and it's typified by its by its uncompassionate power and destruction. It not only defeated its enemies, it not only took what they had, it not only took over their lands and houses and things, but look what it says. They, he, they b- devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue of its feet with its feet. I believe this is a picture and a description of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire. You say, well, how, how important and how influential was the Roman Empire? You ever heard of Roman numerals you used to write down your notes? That didn't come from Allegheny County over here. Unless them people on the news, uh, they had we had that earthquake over in Sparta, and they posted a one of the, one of those news services posted a a stock picture of Sparta, Greece. It said five point three uh, earthquake hits Sparta, and it was a picture of Sparta, the city Sparta in Greece. This is Rome. That great empire, that powerful empire, that vicious empire that went in. And when they went in, it, it, the, the, history tells us that when they went in, they didn't just defeat an enemy, they destroyed an enemy. There's a difference. You defeat somebody, you won the battle, you destroy him. there's nothing left. What did they do when Titus invaded Jerusalem in 70 A.D.? You say, oh, they knocked the buildings down. They not only knocked the buildings down, they brought in workers and for several years they broke the bricks in two. Jesus said, 
tear this building down, and there'll not be one stone standing on another. He was talking about the time Titus would come in in 70 A.D. And the reason they did that, because a rumor had got around that when they built the temple, they had used gold as mortar. And so those people got out there and they chipped every little bit of concrete off of every little brick. And it fulfilled the prophecy that might like make it like an unbelievable... Why, wow, that's ridiculous, Carl. They, some people have said, then, well, that's ridiculous. Rome coming in and, and just tearing it down to the point that every brick, there won't be one brick stacked on another one. But it happened. You see, that's what I'm telling you. Prophecy. When God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. These are the, these are the empires. And when, when, when Daniel started talking about the great beast and the lion, that was in his time. And he went all the way down to when Jesus returns and defeats these nations and establishes his kingdom. You say, well, where's that at? Look at verse 9. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down. What are the thrones? That's the throne of all these kings. That's the thrones of every king that's sitting on thrones today. That's the thrones of every king that will be sitting on thrones when Jesus returns to defeat His enemies at the battle of Armageddon and establish His kingdom. They'll be cast down. Look what it says. And the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow. Who's that sound like? You turn over to Revelation chapter 19, the Bible says the king comes riding a white horse and his garments are spotless. He talks about the, the children, uh, the people of God, uh, Revelation 19, at the great supper of the Lamb, and the Bible says their robes have been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus told a parable about having a marriage supper where the host would always provide a perfect, clean, white robe to come in. And yet they found one there that didn't have that white robe. And he was cast out. What is he talking about? He's talking about Daniel prophesied. This prophecy from Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 to verse 9 is 2,140 years till Rome goes under and then another thousand years when Jesus establishes His thousand year reign. Folks, prophecy prepares us for what's coming. When Jesus comes one of these days, there's going to be a lot of people that ain't ready. There's a lot of people that ain't ready now for the rapture. God rules in the nations, but does He rule in our hearts? If He can rule the nations like that, we need to let Him rule in our hearts. Amen. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. I appreciate you being here today. Like I said, this study... I remember when Paul said, I can't... There's some of you that I can't... I can't feed you with meat. I have to feed you with milk. This is meat right here. This is something you can get your teeth in and gnaw on. This man Daniel, this was 2000, if Daniel died in 537 B.C., and we're living in 2020 A.D., it's 2,500 years ago this man prophesied this. And we can see it unfolding today. We can see the nations rising when you see them going down. God's in charge. God's in control. Is He ruling in your heart? That's the first battleground Jesus fights on. He fights to get you to put Him on the throne of your heart and say, You're King of kings and Lord of lords. 
As we play a hymn of invitation, let's all stand. We talked about prophecy and being ready and one of the things, being ready, giving us a right perspective. I, listen, I, I, I'm like anyone else. I worry about things I see in the world today, but you know what? I don't worry like I don't have the proper perspective. I know what's going to happen. I know who's going to be in charge. I know this is not the end. Why? Because God has given me some prophecy to comfort me and show me and help me and give me the right perspective. I heard a fellow say, that, that, oh, this, it, this may be the end of the world. I said, oh no. I said, if Jesus comes tonight, we've got a thousand and seven years of earth history still. I said, the thing you got to do is be ready. Are you ready? He's ruling the nations, but is He sitting on the throne of your heart today? Boy, we like to sit on that throne, don't we? We like to make call of shots and be in charge. It's what man wants to do in this world. He wants to rule this world. And God says, huh, I'm in charge. I'm ruling the nations. I'm picking them up. I'm setting them down. If you're here today, don't know Jesus as Savior, we would invite you to raise your hand that we could pray for you. We'd invite you to come come to the altar here this morning. We have people who are trained, know how to talk to you about Jesus. You can get that thing settled. Make Him Lord and Savior of your life. Folks, God rules in the nations. He's in charge. Don't worry about it. He's in control. All right. Thank you for being here today. I hope we didn't... Listen, like I said before, this is... Daniel, all the book, just about all the book of Daniel and Revelation and some others are like God wrote a newspaper... You know, they have these newspapers and you wake up. Most, most of them are daily newspapers and they're there the very first thing. God said, I'm going to write my newspaper and when you wake up and pick it up, you're going to read about things that are going to happen a thousand years from now. <laughs> Here's this newspaper right here. Why, we need not worry. We need not fret. God's in control. Everything's happening according to His plan. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen just like He wrote it. So just keep trusting in Him. Keep your eyes on Him. We'll keep serving the Lord and praying and singing and, and uh, giving our tithes and offerings. Amen? Amen. We're just going to keep on doing what the Lord wants us to do. Alright, thank you for being here daily. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. And I'm asking Brother Jerry Evans if he'll dismiss us. Yes, come. Hey, be careful out there. Tell somebody about Jesus this week. We'll see you Wednesday night. Bring it all these notes.